die Natur des Wassers. Hail, hail, again and again, how I rejoice in your lush life, pleasant warmth spreading throughout. Everything emerges from water, everything is preserved by water. Ocean, allow us to enjoy your eternal works. What would the mountains, the plains and the world itself be if it were not for the clouds you send us and the fresh water streams you turn into winding rivers? You are the one that preserves all living things. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Der das frischeste Leben erhält. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, die Natur des Wassers. I would also like to add a second Goethe quote. Life begins where the waters divide, where the waters flow, they also bring forth life. Here animals wallow, and the foliage of the plants begins to merge. Sogleich wird sich lebendig gestalten. Da wälzen Tiere, sie trocknen zum Flor, und Pflanzengezweig, sie dringen hervor. More than a hundred years ago, a forest ranger called Victor Schauberger lived in Austria. I showed you his picture here previously. Unfortunately, not in the best quality. I would now like to quote Schauberger. People think I'm crazy. It could be that they're right. But what difference does one more fool make in this world? However, if I happen to be right and science is wrong, then heaven forbid, may the Lord have mercy on humankind. Victor Schauberger. Man hält mich für verrückt. Mag sein, dass man recht hat. In diesem Fall spielt es keine Rolle, ob ein Narr mehr oder weniger auf der Welt ist. Wenn es aber so ist, dass ich recht habe und dass die Wissenschaft irrt, dann möge der Herr sich der Menschheit erbarmen. Viktor Schauberger. Fortunately for him, Victor Schauberger lived in a high mountain region of Austria with a plateau, a mountain plateau that was unsuitable for being used by the timber industry. As it were, he still had the European virgin forest right under his nose, all of this European virgin forest. This forest was also here, where we are now sitting. This was all once forested, maybe not as dense as you might want to imagine a fir forest today. The trees grew further apart, then with no bushes in between them, allowing the sun to shine through. Fortunately for posterity, Schauberger took a keen interest in this forest. He started to ask questions. Lernte eben Schauberger sehr gut beobachten. Das ist sein großer Verdienst. Und er fing an, sich bestimmte Fragen zu stellen. All the trout suddenly scattered in all directions. This was because a particularly strong trout appeared from below that was heading for the waterfall. It began to swim around it. It appeared as if the trout was swaying to and fro and dancing a kind of round dance with strong rolling movements in the wavy water. Suddenly the trout disappeared under the water jet that was falling down like metal. The trout raised itself upright. Briefly, I saw a wild circular movement in the jet of water that was tapering upwards conically. I couldn't tell what was causing it. The trout in the jet of water loosened itself from the whirlpool and began to float upwards without moving. From the bottom curvature of the whirling mass of water, it then struck the top of the curvature from where it was thrown into the water that was rapidly running off the top. There it made a final strong movement with its tail fin and disappeared. Dort machte sie eine starke Schwanzflossen Bewegung und war verschwunden. What was it that Schauberger had seen? Schauberger was aware that trout prefer to spawn in fresh mountain water. He asked himself the simple question, how do the trout reach the source of water in the high mountains? When there are waterfalls in the course of the river in the stream, what keeps the trout in the flowing mountain stream? What enables the trout to cross over these waterfalls? Conventional biology doesn't really address this issue. Schauberger, however, observed it. Unfortunately, today's biologists don't take the time to caref carefully observe nature. A second scene. This has all been taken straight from his notes. It was on a bright, moonlit night during the spawning season in spring. I was lying in wait next to a waterfall to stop a dangerous poacher. 
What happened on this night happened so quickly that I could hardly stop to think for myself. In the clear moonlight that was coming in at just the right angle, I could see every movement of the numerous fish that had gathered in the cl crystal clear water. I could hardly believe my otherwise sharp eyes. Suddenly a stone almost as big as someone's head began to turn around in circles. Just like the trout in the waterfall before, it began to float upwards. The stone was shaped like an egg. The next moment the stone was lying on top of the water. It quickly gathered a wreath of ice around it and was bobbing up and down as it swam easily in the water, glistening in the shining light of the full moon. Then a second and a third stone followed, and before I knew it, many more stones were floating on the water. Finally, almost all the egg-shaped stones were swimming on top of the water, only the ones with a smooth surface. The chipped stones that had fallen into the water from the mountainside remained motionless on the bottom. At the time, I didn't have a clue as to what was happening. I didn't realize that I had actually been observing a concentration effect. This was field observation, as we would call it, the effect of a whirlpool. What keeps trout in raging waters? Schauberger studied how a spiraling movement of water was produced in the stream from the gills of the fish. He used this knowledge to design technical devices. He said that before you could copy nature, you had to understand it. That was one of Schauberger's typical remarks. You can repeat the simple experiment at home. Place any objects in a tall glass or jar filled with water and stir the water. Now try this with an egg, either a boiled egg or a raw egg. You will be surprised at the difference that this egg shape makes. You can also use different weights or objects with the same weight. Either way, it's very interesting. But Schauberger also investigated very earnest things. He said that he could only report on the dying forest, already more than a hundred years ago, because he observed the falling groundwater level in the other cultivated areas with disastrous flooding, as we are seeing more of today, an imbalance in precipitation, and the decline of agriculture. With the decline of agriculture, he was playing on the fact that more and more for fertilizers were being used to ensure a rich harvest. And of course, he asked himself why this was happening. Here he developed the theory of a half and a whole hydrologic cycle, which I would like to present to you now. It's really quite simple. We're assuming that rain is falling from the clouds. With half a hydrologic cycle, the rain would be falling on sealed surfaces, meaning on developed areas where water cannot penetrate into the ground. Or we have arable land and fields without any trees. With a relatively compacted soil, there is no shade there in the summer. The ground gets quite warm. This causes the water to evaporate, which happens immediately when it is warm. We had this situation just two years ago in the summer with foggy air as in a kitchen, frequent rain with a repeated greenhouse effect. And with the soil not being very loose, the water cannot seep deep enough into the ground. This means that we have water flowing off the surface, which can lead to disasters, or we have the rainwater only seeping into the top layers of the groundwater. That is what is meant with half a hydrologic cycle. The water flows into the oceans where it evaporates again, and so on and so forth. Das ist der halbe Wasserkreislauf, das Wasser fließt in den Ozean, verdampft dort wieder und so weiter und so fort. Now let's look at the healthier complete hydrologic cycle. By going back to the time when Germany was completely forested, it's raining again, the water falls onto the forest soil, the forest soil is loose. You've probably experienced the pleasant feeling when you walk on the more elastic forest floor covered with leaves. Here the water can penetrate into the ground much, much better. That is the one side. On the other hand, we have a negative temperature gradient. This means that through the tree shade, the ground in a forest is much cooler than the ground of a meadow. This causes an evaporation effect when the trees evaporate the water through their leaves. 
Und jetzt kommt noch ein Verdunstungseffekt zustande, den die Bäume realisieren, indem die ja über die Blätter auch wieder Wasser verdampfen. Und Sie kennen das Experiment aus der Schule. You probably still remember the experiment you did at school. If you place a moist cloth in a bottle, it will have a cooling effect. So it is not only the shade, but also the fact that the trees will have a cooling effect on the soil through their roots. The water penetrates very deep, very deep, several kilometers deep, where it will eventually reach deep layers. You've probably heard about this from mining. Here we had our miners who mined uranium. They sometimes worked stripped to the waist because it was so warm down there. This is where the effect of geothermal energy could be felt. The water thus evaporates kilometers deep in the ground. This creates a water vapor pressure. And this pressure moves the water through the many kilometers of the Earth's layers to the surface. Here the water can absorb the minerals, trace elements, and so on and so forth. This means that the water that comes up from the depths will provide the plant world and agriculture with the most magnificent fertilizer. This means that we don't have to add fertilizer from above, but rather that the whole procedure is done from below through the hydrologic cycle. Schauberger now said that most wholesome water, also for us humans, is spring water. Spring water that comes from deep springs, preferably mountain springs. It's already quite amazing how at an altitude of a thousand meters a spring will suddenly gush from out of the ground. Great forces must be at work here. And Schauberger tells us that this spring water, which is four degrees cold when it appears on the surface, that this is the best water there is. On the one hand, because of its trace minerals, and on the other hand, because of its energy, it's four degrees. This is the anomaly of this water. Provide the water provides the water with its highest density and its greatest energy. And it's not by coincidence that the temperature of all refrigerators installed by the Coca-Cola company can't be changed. They've all been set at four degrees. And the bars serving Coca-Cola in the Coke coolers and everywhere, four degrees plus caffeine plus sugar as an energy bomb. But Schauberger didn't want the added caffeine and sugar. He was after the four degrees. And he observed more whirlpools. And from the turbulence that he observed in the natural course of streams, he developed the flumes he constructed for floating logs. Flumes such as the ones built in Austria that were more than 20 and even 30 kilometers long enabling the logs to be floated from the mountain plateau. Flumes that only required small amounts of water. Here Schauberger almost violated the laws of physics because he only used very small amounts of water to transport fairly large-sized logs. I've got footage which I unfortunately have not brought with me. It would have gone beyond the scope of this lecture. There are also eyewitness accounts and newsreels from this era which documents this. Weil er eben mit wenig Wasser relativ große Baumstämme transportieren könnte. Ich habe also hier äh, Filmaufnahmen äh, da darüber. Das habe ich Ihnen leider heute nicht mitgebracht. Das würde den Rahmen sprengen. Aber da existieren noch Augenzeugen äh, oder, oder Wochenschauen besser gesagt aus dieser Zeit, die das dokumentieren. Und im Internet ist das auch zu finden. You can also find material in the internet. Schauberger also did the following. He would always withdraw the water that was getting warmer from these kilometer-long channels and replace it with fresh water that was four degrees cold. He also never flumed during noon. The water was also not allowed to get too warm in order to maintain the correct density. He also added certain bolsters and other elements to his concrete and wooden channels to get the water to swirl so he could make use of the laws of physics. He clearly observed the fundamental forces that were at work here, just as we experienced them in tornadoes, etc. That is quite something. We can actually learn from this, and we should learn to control these forces. They could even play a major role in the future of our energy supply. Und die könnten sogar für die Zukunft der Menschheit im energetischen Sinne eine ganz große Rolle spielen. 
Here in this lower figure, you can see the heart of a May beetle, another example of a natural phenomenon. The heart of a May beetle is completely different from that of a human being with its four chambers. And if we go back to ancient history, we can see something similar in the Minos Palace in Greece, something similar to this heart of a May beetle. These here are terracotta pipes. By using these pipes and this shape, the people could actually overcome differences in altitude. In fact, from the bottom up with flowing water, Schauberger was therefore not the first to exploit this force. He simply observed nature. Schauberger carefully observed how water could become wholesome again. He then built very complex devices designed to restore water to its natural state in order to upgrade tap water in Vienna and other places for the people and the urban population. I just want to leave it at that. The water is cooled and led over serpentines. You can see that here. Vortices are created with minerals being added and so forth. A very elaborate technology. Das Leitungswasser in Wien und so weiter wieder für die Bevölkerung, auch für die Stadtbevölkerung praktisch äh, aufzuwerten. Ich will das mal so stehen lassen. Also das Wasser wird gekühlt, das wird über Serpentinen geleitet. Sie sehen das hier. Es entstehen Wirbelstrukturen, es werden Mineralien zugemischt und so weiter und so fort. Also sehr aufwendige Technik. Here you see a further development where he simplified the technology. Here too you can see the egg shape as a special feature of this device. Water is added, carbon dioxide is added, then the water is practically stirred and released again. It therefore always keeps going round and round and is continuously cooled down. Here as well a cooling procedure was included. Here you can see a patent from 1935 using the so-called trout turbine that he designed. By observing the gills of trout, up here we can see that this is an implosive process, an implosive one. Today's technology often works with explosions. Just think of an automobile where the fuel-air mixture is exploded using ignition sparks or by being compressed as during dieseling. We have lots of explosions today. All the combustion processes as they are known to us, they are all explosive processes. Schauberger raised his finger and said, folks, that's not the way it works. We must go back to implosion in technology. This would also take us back to the vortices. When I put a vortex in motion, it accelerates and then it attracts more matter and compresses the matter. This concentrates more and more energy. That's why the trout turbine is much more efficient in converting energy than what Siemens is installing into its most modern power stations today. So I asked an engineer from Siemens why they were unwilling to learn from these things which are more than 100 years old. He told me that yes, we have to burn a certain amount of energy. After all, we've entered into these supply agreements and business has to thrive. So much for energy conservation. Und dann sagt er, ja, wir müssen ja ein Mindestmaß an Energie verbrennen. Ne? Gibt ja Lieferverträge und alles. Ne? Muss ja irgendwo der Rubel rollen. So viel zur Energieeinsparung. In the year 1937, Schauberger designed a climate machine that looked like this. A heating and cooling machine. This was a precursor of the Klimator, heating and chilling device. These were then built by Siemens according to his instructions. During his absence one day and in violation of his instructions, the workers in the factory started the machine, causing it to melt at a temperature of 4,000 degrees Celsius. Further tests with this type of machine revealed that it produced a dangerous radiation. He gave up all work on the machine, which he later called a Klimator. Here, I just want to show you what happens energetically when you work with these laws of physics. Implosion instead of explosion. And now I would like to show you another thing. Then I will have almost finished talking about Schauberger. Let's take a quick look 
at the Ripple Sator. This is a further development of the Klimator. He upgraded this Ripple Sator in Mauthausen. This was a concentration camp where he developed anti-gravitation technology together with Czech and Polish engineers. Here we're dealing with small prototypes of flying saucers that function according to the principle that you saw previously. Hitler wanted to use them as weapons. Schauberger's problem was that he couldn't control them. This technology, which you see here, when it was activated, it couldn't be stopped or controlled. Either they would be bolted into a foundation where they would then vaporize or they would practically disappear through the roof of the factory never to be seen again. That is as far as Schauberger got. It is of some interest because it also belongs to the secret files of the Third Reich. No nonsense. A well-known natural scientist, Professor Forchheimer, once said the following about Schauberger. I'm glad that I'm already 75 years old. It won't do me much harm to champion your ideas. There will come a day when people will understand them completely. This quote was contained in a letter that Professor Forchheimer wrote to Viktor Schauberger. And I must also mention that Forchheimer had actually been a fierce, fierce opponent of Schauberger many years previously. In der man sie umfassend verstehen wird. Das also ein Brief von Professor Vorschheimer an Viktor Schauberger. Und ich muss dazu sagen, dieser Vorschheimer war ein erbitterter Gegner eigentlich von Schauberger gewesen, Jahrzehnte zuvor. I'd now like to take you to the modern times and introduce a completely different phenomenon. Here you see this married couple. The husband's name is Masaru Emoto. Some of you might have heard the name before. This man also did a lot of research with water. He froze water at minus 40 degrees, and then he photographed it, meaning that he took pictures of drops of water, and he discovered that there are also differences in the shapes of the drops of water, depending on whether you're ta taking photos of healthy or sick water, dirty or clean water. In a frozen condition, the frozen drops of water at the beginning you saw this picture. This shows him working in his cold chamber. The water samples are kept in these small bowls. Actually quite a mundane technology. A freezer, then this deep freeze chamber. Microscopy technique. There is not that much to it, so even though it's really quite simple, conventional science appears to hardly understand its importance. It's looked at as being nonsense and just left at that. Up here is where he photographed London tap water, and below he photographed Paris tap water, chaotic, no real structures. Here he took several pictures from various sections of the Fuji River. On the left we see water from the spring, from the source, beautifully crystallized spring water. To the top right, the central sections of the river, where the river practically fro flows through large cities and gets polluted. And at the bottom right, practically the estuary mouth, where the water flows into the sea, where it can regenerate again. Hier oben hat er fotografiert Londoner Leitungswasser. Und unten hat er fotografiert Pariser Leitungswasser. Chaos. Keine regelrechten Strukturen. Hier hat er mehrere Aufnahmen gemacht von verschiedenen Flussabschnitten des Fuji Rivers. Wir sehen links Wasser von Spring, also von der Quelle, Quellwasser, in einer wunderschönen Kristallisation. Rechts oben der Mittelstrom, also dort, wo der Fluss praktisch an Großstädten vorbeikommt und auch verschmutzt wird. Und rechts unten praktisch die Mündung, wo also dieser Fluss ins Meer einmündet und sich damit wieder regenerieren kann. Here we can see the healing effect of seawater simply by observing, without having it backed up with scientific evidence. He also examined water samples in Argentina, of course from a very healthy reservoir, and below from Brazil, also natural water. Every time when he took his samples from natural water, he had these lovely structures. He had published several books. You can also watch his films at YouTube and elsewhere. This is also very interesting. It's from the spring water of a river in Hiroshima. Hiroshima, where the atomic bomb was released. Here we see how much energy nature exerts in its attempt to regenerate itself. We're conducting similar studies today in Chernobyl. 
It's really unbelievable. The force which nature develops in an attempt to recover from the damage inflicted on it by humankind. This, of course, is not meant to be a license for us to continue to mess things up. Und hier sieht man, wie kraftvoll versucht, die Natur sich wieder zu regenerieren. Und ähnliche Studien führen wir heute in Tschernobyl durch. Also das ist unglaublich, welche Kraft die Natur entwickelt, diesen, äh, diesen Schaden, den die Menschen gesetzt haben, wieder zu regenerieren. Das soll natürlich kein Freibrief sein, weiter diesen, diesen Mist zu bauen. Ne? So. And now he's doing something completely different. He's taking tap water, which has a very chaotic structure, and he's putting it in front of a stereo, and in this case he's playing a piece of music from Bach, simply from a CD. He's taking a picture of the water before he informs it with Bach, so to say, and then afterwards, and afterwards you see this beautiful structure. First it was disdainful tap water with a chaotic structure, and now it gets really weird. Mozart. Footage exists where you can experience this live. Also the frozen condition and everything. It's all very well documented. Hear the music of a healer, in this case an Indian medicine man, who's singing. And you can see heavy metal. That's the bang bang music. Our bodies contain 70% water. Our brains contain even more water. If you constantly listen to this music, then this is what it will look like in your head. So, now we know why music can have such a wholesome effect or can produce chaos inside us. I myself use music therapy. This has become quite uncommon in Germany because you can't earn money with that. During my music therapy sessions, the people are lying in a water bed, but not in a normal water bed where they're lying on top, rather in a water bed where they submerge into the water without getting wet. They're protected by a rubber membrane. The waterbed is equipped with special loudspeakers. The people are then lying down in Mozart. And believe it or not, sleeplessness and the most serious panic disorders can be treated like this. But I don't want to promise any healing effect in public, heaven forbid, but I do see it happen often. Instead of giving someone medicine, you simply let them listen to music, not only with their ears, but with their whole body so that they can absorb the vibrations. And with this equipment, you can do that. Masaru Emoto, I highly recommend that you take a look at this man. Und dann liegen die in Mozart. Und Sie werden gar nicht glauben, dass dort Schlafstörungen und, und äh, die schlimmsten psychischen Panikzustände behandelt werden können. Also ich will jetzt keine Heilversprechen machen, um Gottes Willen, ja, aber ich erlebe es ja im Alltag, dass man manchmal, statt ein Medikament zu geben, einfach mal mit Musik konfrontiert wird, und zwar nicht nur über die Ohren, sondern mit dem ganzen Körper die Schwingung mal aufnehmen kann. Und das ist eben in dieser Anlage möglich. Ja, Masuo, äh, Masaru Emoto, sehr zu empfehlen, sich mal mit diesem Mann auseinanderzusetzen. The town of Bad Abach is located near Regensburg and it has an imperial thermal bath. After four hours of bathing on German Unification Day last year, I suddenly had such an itch while I was drying myself that I measured the concentration of the chlorine in the water. To my surprise, I could have gone into any other public swimming pool which has neither thermal water nor an ozonization system. The water in that imperial thermal bath probably did me more harm than good. In Hungary, Bulgaria and Greece, I can still enjoy real wholesome water. Whereby I would like to stress the word still. Many good thermal water baths are now being treated with chlorine here in Germany. And when the chlorine dominates so strongly, then we will of course also absorb these dominant amounts of chlorine in our body, which means that the other trace elements will not have the same wholesome effect, which they should have. Quite a shady affair indeed. You should really go to Hungary or to southern Slovakia, where there still are proper healing waters. People actually went to war for water. 
and unfortunately, they still will in future. We just have to think about China with its serious shortage of drinking water. Good drinking water is extremely scarce. That's why large food producers such as Nestle are systematically buying up sources of potent drinking water throughout the world. When money no longer rolls for oil, it will roll for water. Scarcity is always a profitable business, and scarcity can also be artificially induced and controlled accordingly. You might then recall my words. The real question is, does water have a memory? Emoto raised this question. If water has a memory, we could then explain homeopathy with its many dilutions. If water does not have a memory, homeopathy would then be mere charlatanism. Or we would be dealing with a placebo effect. This already means that it would be interesting to examine this issue further. It would also be interesting to see how much water our body uses. For example, our kidneys filter 150 to 180 liters a day. Our kidneys must filter this amount daily. If you don't drink enough, and I see this all the time in my practice, then you could be suffering from a so-called rollo formation of your blood cells. This means that the red blood cells form stacks or aggregations similar to coins in a till, thereby clogging the small capillaries and restricting the flow of blood. The capillaries that supply the cells with blood are so small that under normal conditions a red blood cell will have to pass lengthways in order to fit through. If you don't drink enough and your red blood cells start to become stacked or form clusters, your overall blood flow will still function, meaning that you can still measure your pulse and all the rest. But as mentioned before, small clots will form on the capillary walls. That is why, for example, stories exist in the Orient that report on this phenomenon. Und deswegen ist es so, dass zum Beispiel in Orient Geschichten existieren, die darüber berichten, wenn man zum Arzt geht. When you go to the doctor, his assistant will give you a big jug of water and ask you to empty it. And if you're still sick after you've drunk the water, that's when you get to see the doctor. Of course, that is just a metaphor, but it shows us how important water is and how we're neglecting this somewhat. As in former times when it was deemed unfit for ladies to drink water in public, they were only allowed to nip at it. And that was only 80 years ago. That's how we were brought up. Yet we should drink certain amounts. Those of us with a healthy heart and healthy kidneys should drink two to three liters of water and tea a day, without counting coffee or other drinks, since you will need water again to metabolize these drinks. We have tremendous problems with our water, and these problems are often simply dismissed. One and a half years ago, I attended a conference that was being held here by the Department of the Environment in Saxony. This was a professor of physics and a professor of chemistry and myself. Then we got into a heated discussion. Toward the end of it, an engineer from this company that supplies all of Dresden with energy and water, a company called Drewag, came up on the stage and said, Gentlemen, I don't know what this dispute is all about. Everything is okay. We take samples regularly. All the parameters are within the limit. Our water is tops. You can read this in the newspapers and on a homepage. Here we should ask ourselves, what for heaven's sake are they analyzing? For example, is the amount of hormones in the water being examined? Just imagine a large city such as Dresden. How many women here are on the pill? And all of that is being peed into the water, with no one there to filter it out. Meanwhile, the men are becoming impotent through the softeners and the female hormones, and through their mobile phones in their pockets, and many other things, stress, all these people with the beta blockers and what have you, medicine for your blood pressure, for lowering your cholesterol, all of that goes into the water. No one filters it out, no one measures it. Once and again, there might be a small scale study, privately financed, which is then followed by an outcry and then simply ignored. Those are great problems. We can take our drinking water from the tap, but if we really want wholesome water, then we have to treat it. Similarly to how Schauberger showed us. For example, I used a device that, that works with reverse osmosis. 
This is how it is done. First, I have a gravel packed filter, then I have a sand filter, and then I have an activated charcoal filter. Of course, it has to be changed regularly. Otherwise, the whole process will be reversed. It is meant to have an antibacterial effect, the activated charcoal. And if I don't change it, it will then become a real germ deposit. Only then is the reverse osmosis membrane applied. It will only let water molecules pass, however, along with nitrate and nitrite. The companies selling the devices usually don't tell you this. It will also contain heavy metals. That's why beside the reverse osmosis device, I also use a gelat filter. This device filters out the heavy metals, for instance. Then I will get something resembling distilled water. But it isn't really distilled water. It is actually a reverse osmosis water and therefore comparable to distilled water. It is in actual fact dead. There are no minerals in it. And that it isn't really healthy. Some people say you should drink distilled water. Numerous books have been written on the subject. They say it's the cleanest water you can get, but that's not right. You could try that for a week if you like. It won't harm you, but if you were to try it for a longer period of time and you continue to drink this empty water, then the mucous membranes in your digestive tract would begin to discharge their trace elements into the empty water. We're constantly confronted with diffusion in our body your mucous membrane cells will become depleted of minerals and this will change the osmotic oncotic pressure and your mucous membranes will begin to burst open and you will have a really nice mucus situs. That is why I remineralize my water. If you want to remineralize your water, all you have to do is make tea with it. The tea contains minerals and also essential oils. Marvelous. You should drink tea made with distilled water if you like or with osmosis water and that way you will already have done yourself a lot of good. We should be thinking along these lines. Universities were once founded to allow people to teach and research independently and freely. The main subject was originally philosophy, which was meant to examine ethical issues and to link the individual subject areas together. If we look at water, without its context, we will never get to the bottom of the water, so to say. For example, we shouldn't neglect the knowledge gained in the field of quantum physics, evolution and biochemistry. To understand the regenerative and healing effects of water, I will now also have to touch upon several subject areas. In the last decades, our worldview has become bent on material facts. Science is pursuing reductionism and its belief in the objectivity of research. In 1596, in his book, Novum Organum, the Englishman Francis Bacon coined the popular dictum that knowledge is power. What he meant was that we should become familiar with nature and take possession of it by exploiting it for the benefit of humankind. To be able to do this effectively, we have to separate ourselves from nature. In other words, as a human being, I must stand apart from nature and confront it as a neutral observer and experimenter. The scientific researcher thus considers himself to be an impartial observer from outside nature who's standing outside of his experiments. He thus effectively ignores his own influence. René Descartes added to this by establishing today's common premise of reductionism. He proposed that if an object is complex enough, it should be taken apart so that it can be examined more thoroughly. The individual parts are then disassembled until a level is reached where they become indivisible. On the surface, it would appear that through his decomposition method, Descartes was clearly saying that we should be able to understand the secrets of life and thus the laws of nature. However, with today's socially acceptable reductionism, science has created another problem. It not only places itself above the laws of nature, but it also often is unable to see the whole picture. This plays on the trend towards specialization. Yet with the material aspects, we should not neglect the spiritual aspects. Polarity signifies mutuality, designating a wholeness located between the poles. Polarity also means that we must be mindful of the balance that can develop between the poles. When someone is thrown off balance, they fall into a state of duality.
When one side prevails, i.e., when the person becomes one-sided, this leads to a deficiency on the other side. We should always keep that in mind. In normal academic, academic life, we hardly have time for such thoughts. After all, many research scientists are only working on specific projects, where they're also under enormous time pressure. Seen from a neutral perspective, it would appear that natural science is something that is clear, logical and comprehensible, just like the H2O formula and that's it. Yet in actual fact, we don't even know how the bubbles appearing in a boiling water actually arise. It simply can't be because of the changeover from a liquid to a gaseous state of aggregation. The ISS space station is researching these phenomena because of the deceleration of this process in outer space. Many medical practitioners consider water to be only a solvent for various substances, yet that alone raises a number of issues. For example, how can such marvelous creatures as jellyfish develop in the sea? They are living proof of our startling ignorance of the nature of matter. Seawater consists of 97% water. The remaining 3% are salts, dirt, and other organic compounds. Jellyfish, on the other hand, consist of 99.9% water. That means they only contain 0.1% organic and inorganic compounds. Yet, jellyfish procreate, move about, have their own metabolism, and as merv stingers, they even glow in the deep sea. They all do all of this even though they only consist of 0.1% organic and inorganic substance and a total of 99.9% .9 water. By contrast, during infancy human beings consist of 90% water and as adults of 70% water. Interestingly enough, 70% of the earth is also covered with water. We should not only consider water by itself, otherwise we'll not be able to understand its effect. If a human cell were to be cooled down to zero degrees, no chemical reaction would take place, even if enough molecules were present in the cell. Our present chemists hardly account for this physiological law within cells. If someone were to lie down in a completely dark room and you were to examine them with a low light amplifier such as Fritz Albert Popp did for many years, it would be evident that the person would emit far fewer photons than plants do under the same test conditions. A jellyfish on the other hand even glows in the extremely cold conditions of the deep sea. We could even see this with our naked eye. Perhaps this is be because the photon rays emitted by a biological system decrease with the complexity of its structure. One could assume that the complicated regulatory mechanisms of complex structures would be able to use energy more efficiently. Photons are able to excite the electrons of molecular atoms in a manner that these will jump onto the next higher shell. Thus excited, the molecules then have greatly increased chances of reacting with other molecules. Molecules only react chemically if at least one of the molecules taking part in the reaction is first excited. This clearly shows that they must be provided with energy. As biological systems, we absorb photons with a charge of approximately 3 electron volts, which are in the visible wave range. They activate the water molecules and their cluster structure in the extracellular space, thus enhancing a wide variety of diffusion processes. This leads to an increase in metabolic activity. Cells can be considered as being cavity resonators that function with an interference of 200 to 8800 nanometers. Photos, photons bring about the already mentioned quantum leap of the electrodes of a respective molecule. This leads to the responsiveness that in some cases can trigger complete chemical chain reactions in a coherent manner. Certain atoms will react to certain frequencies, i.e. they will resonate. Others are actually completely immune to the frequency. Light energy can be stored to a limited extent through the quantum leap of these processes. If the reaction covers too large an area and the associated energy requirement is too great, the electrons will leap back and reduce the whole responsiveness of the molecules that contributed to the process. At the same time, the photons are released again. Each cell can thus function as a light transmitter. In this manner, photons ensure that atoms are kept in a state that enables them to create molecules and expand into cells and organs. 
Similarly, constructive and destructive interferences that function like switches exist alongside each other. Constructive interference are a condition in which it is highly likely that photons are present that will by and large lead to a strengthening of the electromagnetic field and that can distribute energy phases differently in the body and that will also increase the biological autorhythms. Human beings possess more than 1,013 cells. Under normal conditions, each second, approximately 100,000 chemical reactions occur in a cell. Similarly, each second, 107 cells die and are usually replaced. This complex system must be regulated and, what's more important, it must be controlled. Hippocrates already formulated the most important criteria for a person's health as being a balance of their inner milieu. A human cell has an average volume of 10 to the power of 9 cubic centimeters. How can a chemist hope to ever be able to analyze the exact reactions that take place in such a cell? He can only try if he applies the reductionism described above and examines partial areas. In other words, science only has a very limited access to these processes. This also clearly shows us the gulf between science and medicine. Fritz Albert Popp commented on this as follows. The options available to nature are greatly superior to those of our analytic technology. Reality is so complex that we're only able to understand a fraction of the information that we collect. A scientist should be able to accept the fact that he will not be able to understand a large part of the world. On the other hand, he's often confronted with unjustified demands. To admit that I haven't understood something should not be seen as being a sign of weakness, but rather as being a sign of strength. Healthy physiological signals are logarithmically coherent signals that change according to their surroundings. Seen through a low light amplifier, healthy food reveals coherent photon rays. The quantum physicist Schrödinger commented on this phenomenon as follows. Human beings are chaotic creatures that try to maintain order, that is, they try to keep their system in an undisturbed state. It would now be upon science to figure out which frequency releases which chemical reaction. Along with the non-linearity of physiological signals, it is also important to know that in a healthy condition, a Gaussian bell curve would never appear as a normal distribution when we analyze complex measuring values, e.g. when we assess the conductivity on an organism at hundreds of measuring points. The resulting curve of a healthy condition would have to reveal a logarithmic normal distribution. If a Gaussian bell curve were to appear, this would be an indication that the organism is reacting stochastically, meaning that the organism's regulatory capacity has frozen. This in turn would mean that an organism's cellular communication and its metabolism have lost their ability to regulate themselves, an event that would be as alarming as cancer. Time and again, I've noticed this frozen regulatory ability among cancer patients in my practice. I was never sick. All my colleagues around me were absent. I was always healthy. Catch a fever? Not me. Such remarks from patients should make us sit up and take notice. Along with the photons, the neutrinos also play a major role. Neutrinos are usually not associated with human beings or with biology as such because they're considered to belong to astronomy and astrophysics. I'd like to say a few things about neutrinos. At first, they were considered to be particles without mass until it was discovered that the opposite was true. In fact, in the future, neutrinos will be playing a very significant role in natural science, otherwise the equilibrium prevailing in astrophysics, in geology, and the other disciplines will no longer hold true. For example, the Earth is growing continuously each year, and the Sun is also growing. This means that we have a continuous increase in mass, and here the question arises. Where does this extra mass come from? As far as we know today, neutrinos mainly develop from so-called black holes. Black holes exist at the center of galaxies, for example. These black holes have such enormous forces that they're able to absorb all matter and compress it. The result of this process could possibly be neutrinos. In astrophysics today, we call the neutrinos that leave black holes high-speed, high-energy neutrinos. They cannot interact with human beings, plants, or animals. They simply sweep through us. Many people have completely wrong impressions of matter. Let's consider the models of an atom. 
If the core of an atom were the size of a pea, the next electron shell would be about 2.5 kilometers away. It would then be another 2.5 kilometers to the next atomic nucleus. This model in which we perceive the core of an atom as being the size of a pea would therefore be located 5 kilometers between the two peas. That is how matter is constructed. And this of course leaves plenty of space for quantum to shoot through without interacting. If these neutrinos, these high-speed and high-energy neutrinos, were now to strike a gigantic celestial body such as the Sun, they would then be slowed down and emit energy in the form of light and heat and then emerge again as medium-speed and medium-energy neutrinos which could then interact with celestial bodies such as the Earth. This brings up the question of how terrestrial heat is retained for millions of years. We not only have an increase in size, but also in geothermal energy. After all, we have to maintain an energy balance somehow. When the neutrinos eventually pass through the Earth, and I'm now simplifying things somewhat now, low speed and low energy neutrinos appear. This then is, from time immemorial, we have called life force. Chi, prana, odd, orgone energy, call it what you like. Here it would be interesting to look at the work of people such as Wilhelm Reich, a physician and Freud's favorite student, who was able to condense this emission in so-called orgone accumulators and used it to treat diseases including cancer, with great success. Reich experienced two book burnings, one in Nazi Germany and the other in the supposedly liberal America. He was also forced to destroy his therapy equipment in front of the medical commission in the United States. With their intense exercises, advanced yogis can reduce their metabolism and their body temperature to a level where they can survive for months without eating or drinking. Yet, they still use energy. This is connected with the neutrinos. Now we have to look at how the neutrinos get to the photons and develop these thoughts a bit further. Let's do this together, even if it is quite demanding. After all, you'll never find these thoughts in a conventional textbooks. Why do plants reabsorb less neutrinos than organisms with a nervous system? Quite simply, the simpler the nervous system of an organism, the less interaction there is with neutrinos. We, and also our communication, including on a cellular level, are influenced by electromagnetic fields. Warum können Pflanzen weniger Neutrinos resorbieren als Organismen, die mit einem Nervensystem ausgestattet sind? Je einfacher das Nervensystem von Organismen strukturiert ist, umso geringer die Interaktion mit Neutrinos. Wir und unsere Kommunikation auch auf zellulärer Ebene sind geprägt von elektromagnetischen Feldern. Emilio del Guidici from the University of Milan refers to molecules as being polygamous, meaning that a molecule can react with any other molecule with which it can happen to come into contact. This is at least the case in chemistry, where different products can arise at random from reactions. In biology, such random products from reactions are much less common. Here we have monogamous molecules with controlled molecular encounters, which are therefore subject to controlled reactions. Why did biological molecules become monogamous? The theory of electrodynamics tells us that when two molecules have the same frequency, a strong attractive force is exerted between them. This affects the space of the complete field in this area. Under certain conditions, this can lead to reinforcement effects. By contrast, different molecular frequencies will lead to a tiny field. The purpose of water molecules appears to be to develop fields that have an intensifying or weakening influence on the effect of other molecules, depending on the resonant or dissonant cluster structure. Water molecules will normally not react chemically in a random manner, but rather in a biologically intelligent way. We will have to look at this biological intelligence in more detail later when we discuss evolution. The universe is not permeated with vacuums, as has been occasionally thought, but instead it is filled with a wide variety of quanta. We've already looked at neutrinos and photons. Neutrinos can turn into photons when they collide with water molecules. Here, blue light flashes will occur as we were able to record with our photo multipliers of the neutrino telescope at Lake Baikal. 
a joint research project of the Russian Academy of Science and the GDR Institute in Soiton. Soiton was responsible for analyzing the technical data with the Russians providing the know-how at Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal was chosen because it is the deepest sweet water lake. We needed the sweet water to minimize the corrosion of the equipment. The advantage of Lake Baikal was that it was frozen, which allowed us to sink our photo multiplier using heavy crane technology. If the photons are emitted again after energy has been stored for a certain period, the atoms and particularly their electrons will fall back into their initial position. If these excited atoms are part of a high concentration of molecules, they will then become an in initial ignition for a molecular dance. This means that the excitement will spread to a larger surrounding area. But this depends on a corresponding resonant molecular frequency. Of interest here are the proportions that we should never neglect in our theoretical considerations. In reality, one atom corresponds with the 100 millionth part of a centimeter. The photon that we see as having to excite the atom is thus 1,000 times larger than the atom that is being excited. If we allow water to boil under normal atmospheric conditions at sea level, 20,000 water molecules of the generated water vapor will have space in the assumed volume of a photon. The photon corresponds with the minimum fluctuation of a field and this again corresponds with its wavelength. This in turn is dependent on the energy density of the corresponding photon. That is why one photon can excite several atoms at the same time and one neutrino can release several photons. The circle from the neutrino to the photon and then from the atom to the molecule is now complete. The molecule can now react with other molecules, a process which is called metabolism. When sufficient water molecules are available, this area can turn into a photon trap. The resulting electromagnetic field can include additional water molecules and trap other photons. This will lead to an increase in the density and growth of the electromagnetic field. When a specific electromagnetic field strength is exceeded, additional molecules are also attracted along with water molecules. The frequency of the resulting field is altered by the foreign molecules and the resonance compared to pure water molecules begins to fade. The water can now fluctuate and create a large variety of molecular reactions. After these reactions have been completed, hardly a hydrogen resonance remains and the system will gradually release its energy again, for example, as photons. Our research has shown that the frequency of the photons is responsible for the molecules that gather in the electromagnetic field that is being created. This process can be demonstrated by directing a laser onto a specific solvent mixture and recording the resulting changes to the molecular concentration around the laser and in the remaining mixture. The laser beam will, as it were, attract molecules that are resonant with the laser frequency. If the laser frequency is altered, the molecular concentration in the mixture will also change accordingly. In biochemistry, the frequency of the corresponding photons creates and controls the right molecular reactions. Random reactions are thus avoided. This is therefore a controlled process requiring a code. For example, although 100 amino acids are known in biology, only 20 amino acids are able to react in the human organism. Why then are the remaining 80 amino acids being ignored? Only 20 amino acids are able to establish a resonance with the human organism. Here the length of the phase of the complex vibrations appears to be decisive. The phase of the amino acids that we find in human beings is primarily consistent with that of water. Of particular interest is the fact that mainly embryonic cells accept the molecular reaction patterns of the cells surrounding them. This also allows for a consistency that is responsible for the embryonic cells taking over the tasks of the surrounding organic area. This results in animated systems displaying a dynamic order. Their frequencies can even be measured in a range extending from nanometers to meters. Particularly nerve cells clearly reveal that macroscopic cell structures are responsible for transmitting and receiving electromagnetic waves. Respiration is the combustion of hydrogen and carbon. This leads to a reduction of oxygen with the release of photons. 
particularly mitochondria respiratory systems that are responsible for this combustion process. Since 1794, we know that combustion processes cannot take place without water. For example, coal would not burn if the water inside it were to be completely removed. During the combustion process, the carbon is oxidized by the oxygen contained in the water and not in the air. It is not the coal alone that burns, but also the water inside it. The biologist Vladimir Voikov from the Lomonosov Moscow State University described this process as follows. The oxygen in the air is reduced by the hydrogen in the water. In other words, the water catalyzes the oxidation. During this process, water is burnt and then recycled to form water again. If we treat water with the radio waves of specific frequencies, this will cause the hydrogen and oxygen to split. This mix mixture can then be ignited. As Voikov explains further, water that comes from natural waterfalls, natural fog, or also from living organisms is always carbonated water. Carbonates support the combustion of water. Bicarbonated water that is bombarded with electrons will even produce visible light. If you bombard bicarbonated water with electrons and add 0.0005% hydrogen peroxide, even the water will start to burn. Although no additional oxygen is being added in the process, the photon emissions can last for months. This means that aqua bicarbonates that are located in an instable system can be used as a photon source. Since we are assuming the validity of the law of the conservation of energy, the water must then absorb energy. If we look closer, we will see that water consists of two phases. The one phase is positively changed by an excess of protons and behaves chaotically. The other phase is negatively charged by an excess of electrons and is consistent. Small impulses can now release these excess electrons. If the two water if the two phase water is now irradiated with radio waves, its storage capacity will increase and it will be able to take in large amounts of electrons. The two phase water functions like a capacitor. Instead of producing energy, water converts it. Water is thus not a generator, but rather a transformer. Hence, aqueous systems can transform waste energy, such as excess heat, into highly concentrated energy. But this will only work with liquid water. In the presence of nitrogen, the nitrogen is ionized, enabling the creation of more complex polymers. This allows complex organic substances to be biosynthesized under the simplest conditions. It's really a question of which substances are meant to be created. Here we need the information required to bring form into shape. This is also how my initial hypothesis formulated. Matter equals energy plus information. Hierfür benötigen wir Informationen, Form in Form bringen, so entstand meine These, Materie ist gleich Energie plus Information. Vielen Dank. Also nochmal herzlichen Dank. Alles Gute für Sie. Ja, danke.